Hello and welcome. We are so glad that you're here for today's webinar Wednesday. Today's webinar is on the standards of quality and how we can support families through best practice through um, the standards of quality for family strengthening and support. And I am Julie Matusik, and I will be presenting today's webinar. And um, a couple of things just to mention before we um, dive right in. If you are joining online, I will be, um, you'll listen directly through your computer speakers. And if you have joined via the phone number that Zoom provided, uh, your line has been muted to minimize background noise. And for those of you that are online, please, uh, you can see the link to the Dropbox folder in the chat. Cheryl is going to put in just a moment here, and there it is. And that is where you'll find all of our handouts for today's webinar. And in addition, we invite you to put questions in at any time into the Q&A portion. So the chat, um, that chat box is open for you to include any comments during the webinar, um, but we do ask that you direct all of your questions to that Q&A section of Zoom. And if you're having any tech issues, we have live tech support here. Cheryl is here to help you. So feel free to message her if you're having any challenges. And I will try to get to all of the questions at the end of the webinar. And if I'm unable to, someone from the National Family Support Network will follow up with you after the webinar. And also want to mention that today is PowerPoint. The handouts that are linked here, as well as the recording of this webinar, will be available on the National Family Support Network website tomorrow um, at this time of day. So um, last thing is when you exit the webinar, an evaluation will automatically appear on your screen. So we ask you to take a moment to complete that evaluation as it provides us with very valuable feedback to inform future webinars. All right, got some of our housekeeping items out of the way there. So now we would love to get an idea of who is on this webinar with us today. So take a look at this map and you'll see how we have divided the regions, um, the nation into regions. So take a look at the map and see which corner of the United States you are in. And Cheryl is going to launch a poll so we can all see who is with us today. There we go. So take a moment to let us know which region you're joining us from, or if you're joining us from Canada. And if you're out um, joining us from outside of the US or Canada, please let us know in the chat. All right, give you about five more seconds here, and then we'll take a look at those results. All righty. How exciting. So we have our strongest representation is from the West. Welcome. And about equal representation from the Northeast, South, Midwest, and Canada. So that is so exciting. Thank you so much for um, participating in that poll. It's great to see we have some great geographic diversity here today. Alrighty, so let's take a moment. We have one other poll. Um, well, two other polls, sorry. The next one is about your affiliation. So um, we're going to, Cheryl's going to launch this poll for us so you can let us know what type of organization you work for. So are you working for a family resource center or maybe another family support program? Or are you working at the network level of family resource center networks? Or are you in government, maybe child welfare or another uh, department of government, private funder, education, or a consultant? Of course, we have the other. Take another couple seconds here and let us know. All right. 
Let's see here. Looks like we have our strongest representation from Family Resource Center folks. So that is awesome. We also have the network level represented here, as well as education consultant and that other. Very exciting. Thank you so much for responding. And um, the last question that we have is about your role. So which level are you working at? Maybe you're working at the policy or systems level, maybe you're working at the management level, or maybe you're working at the program or directly with families. All right, you get those results. That is wonderful. We have all levels rec uh, represented here. So policy systems, management, program drug service, and other. Great. Well, thank you so much for responding to those. It's great to get a sense of who is here with us today. So that can help frame our conversation. All right. So let's dive in. So, um, we, the National Family Support Network, were founded uh, back in 2011 by just eight states um, that were at the table and came together. Since then, we have more than quadrupled in size. So um, now up to 38 member networks that are uh, representative of more than 3,000 family resource centers that serve more than 2 million people annually. And um, also want to flag here that if you um, represent one of the green uh, states that are not green yet, definitely reach out to us. We would love to connect with you. Our mission is to promote positive outcomes for all children, families, and communities by leveraging the collective impact of family resource centers, um, networks, and championing quality family support and strengthening practices and policies. So again, we especially want to connect with representatives from any state that is not currently green on the map. So reach out to us. And our vision in short is that um, we're turning that whole map green so that all families will have access to quality family support services in their very own communities provided by family resource centers that are supported by strong networks. And we have th three areas of work. So everything we do at the National Network is divided into one of these three areas. So the first is connecting and convening member networks to enhance their effectiveness. So increasing the connectedness amongst members for peer learning and for mutual support. And the second is to promote family support best practice and evaluation. So raising awareness of what quality family support is and promoting a common language standards and evaluation of it through the national implementation of the standards of quality for family strengthening and support. So that's why we're all here today is to advance that work. And the third area of work is raising the visibility of the value and the impact of family strengthening and support networks in order to strengthen and increase support for families. All right, here is our roadmap of our time together today. Um, so lots to talk about, um, talking about first the background of the standards and providing an overview of the standards. And then we'll talk about standards implementation, both at the program and network level. Then we will have an opportunity for question and answer. And we'll close with sharing some resources and opportunities that are available to you through the national network. And last but not least, that evaluation. Again, we appreciate you taking the opportunity to fill that out. It is so helpful to inform our future webinar planning. All right, so our focus with these standards is on families who are responsible for raising children. So these families consist of at least one adult and one child who are related biologically, emotionally, or legally. And families may consist of one parent, two parents, grandparents, foster parents, legal guardians, or they may arise from a need for mutual support. 
And looking at our standards timeline, you can see here, this is kind of the, uh, literally the timeline of the standards development. So back in 2012, these standards were developed by the California Network. That's where it all began. And then in 2013, the National Network adopted the standards for national implementation. And then in 2020, the National Network engaged member networks from across the country, um, as so including parent leaders, folks from uh, Canadian Family Support Organizations, and the Center for the Study of Social Policy to review and to revise the standards with a particular focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as relevance for both the United States and Canada. And um, twenty, and then 2021, the new version was approved by the NFSN membership. So um, we we started offering that last year. So that's a little historical glance back. And with these standards, we want to share why they're so important. So. These standards help ensure that families are supported and strengthened through quality practice. And these standards also create a common language as well as ex expectations across different types of family strengthening programs. So regardless of whether you're with a family resource center or another family support program, you can have that shared language. And these standards are designed to be used by all stakeholders. So whether you're working for a public department, for a foundation, a community-based organization, and families, um, all stakeholders can use these as a tool for planning, for providing, and assessing quality practice. And another thing that we want to underscore here too is that we are not trying to sell these standards. These standards, we it's so important that um, we want everyone to have access to and be able to think about quality work with families. So that is why you'll see we're not selling them. These standards are available for free as well as all of the standards implementation tools. So if you go to the NFSN website and click on standards, it'll drop down. And if you go to um, the overview tab is where you'll uh, download the standards if you'd like to, if you haven't done that yet. Um, and then the implementation tools tab is where you'll find all of those implementation tools. So it's all right there laid out um, free of charge. So speaking of um, everyone using the standards, let's talk about how everyone can use these standards. So if you are working for a family strengthening and support program, which I know was a large portion that's here today, you can use the standards as a blueprint for implementing best practice for self-assessment and to demonstrate quality. If you are working directly with families, you can use the standards to reflect on and enhance your work with families. If you're working at the network level of uh, family strengthening and support providers, so at the FRC network level, you can use the standards for quality assurance. You can use the standards for training and technical assistance and to adopt as expectations um, for membership. If you are a policy maker, welcome. We're so glad you're here and um, you can use the standards to endorse for application in your areas of influence. If you are a funder, I know we had some funders here today too, you can use the standards to integrate into requests for proposals, for monitoring and quality assurance. And last but certainly not least, if you represent a family, you can use the standards to partner with programs um, to apply the standards. And you can use the standards to provide feedback about how well the program is applying the standards. All right. So um, now let's talk about the program's application of the standards. So I know we had a lot of folks that are working at the program level, like at the Family Resource Center level. It requires the commitment and the support of all levels of program responsibility. 
So executive directors, managers, coordinators, service staff, parent leaders, and families all coming together to, um, to work to work together. So it's not something a an executive director could do by herself. And it's not something that a um, maybe a direct service staff could do by himself, working in partnership. So all of those levels. And these standards are um, uniquely integrate and operationalize two key frameworks from our field. And you may have heard of these prior to today, but maybe not. So the first is the Principles of Family Support Practice that was developed by Family Support America and the Research-Based Evidence-Informed Strengthening Families Protective Factor Framework and Approach that was developed by the Center for the Study of Social Policy. So um, we're going to talk about both of these just for a moment because they are so important um, and that's what the standards are based upon. So uh, we're actually going to launch a poll. And we are going to ask if you have heard of these principles of family support practice um, before today. And um, just letting us know, yes or no, if you've heard of the principles of family support before today. Okay, let's see those results. Oh, almost 50-50 here. All right. So we'll go over these, but we'll be a little review for some of you. And if not, no worries. We'll have you all caught up here in just a moment. So as some of you may know, these principles were developed by a national organization, Family Support America, back in 1981. And so that organization has since sunset, but this framework continues to guide and frame our field today. And so let's talk about these principles. So the first one um, says that the staff and families are working together in relationships based on equality and on respect. So while this principle in 2022 doesn't seem so revolutionary, at the time it was written, it presented quite a challenge to the system. At that time, the prevailing wisdom was that the staff were the experts with their education, their knowledge, and their experience, and that their goal was to quote unquote fix the problem family. But this principle challenged that notion. And this um, says that the staff do, of course, come to the table with their education, their knowledge, and their experience, but that the families also bring their own strengths and resources and are the most knowledgeable about their past experiences. And it is by working as partners in relationships based on equality and on respect that we will achieve the best outcomes for that family. All right, the second principle says that staff enhance families' capacity to support the growth and the development of all family members, so adults, youth, and children. So this principle, it emphasizes that we in this field look at the whole family, not just the individual. So if one member of the family is participating in the activities we want to be asking about and inviting other members of the family as well. We know that when multiple family members are involved, the family will be more likely to have the best outcomes. And the third principle, it says that families are resources to their own members, to other families, to the programs, and to their communities. So unique to the family support perspective is that we do not see staff as having all of the answers or doing all of the work to support families. Families themselves are working and encouraged to support other families. And there's also a strong emphasis on connecting families to share resources such as information and peer support. All right, principle four says that the programs affirm and strengthen families' cultural, racial, and linguistic identities and enhance their ability to function in a multicultural society. 
So this principle is commonly referred to as the diversity principle, and it has two parts. So the first is about respecting and welcoming the diversity that families bring. So whether that's um, linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, family structure, things like that. And then the second part is about preparing them for and connecting them with the larger community in which they will naturally interact with people that are very different from themselves. And so this supports them to fully participate in our diverse society in which we live. And the fifth principle says that the programs are embedded in their communities and contribute to the community building process. So family support programs, they don't see themselves as simply social service providers, but as community builders as well. By strengthening families, they make key contributions to the health of the communities. They also work to develop families' responsibility and leadership for strengthening and building their communities. All right, let's look at the sixth principle together. So this says that programs advocate with families for services and systems that are fair and responsive and accountable to the family served. So take a moment just to reflect and think about some of the major systems that families commonly interact with. So maybe healthcare, education, the legal systems, things like that. So are these systems fair? and responsive and accountable? Often not. So that's where our work comes in as family support providers to work with families to help improve these systems. All right, let's look at the seventh principle here. So practitioners work with families to mobilize formal and informal resources to support family development. So there's a strong emphasis in the family support field on resources. The most common type of family support program is called a family resource center. So you can see right in the name, um, the emphasis on resources. And while no program could directly provide all of the supports that a family may need, it's our responsibility to know how to connect them to them. All right, principle eight says that the programs are flexible and continually responsive to emerging family and community issues. So this concept of flexibility and responsiveness are so important in the family support field because neighborhoods and communities change. So maybe a, a neighborhood that is majority of Latinx today may be majority Asian in five years. And so issues emerge that significantly affect families, such as economic downturn. And programs need to be flexible and responsive to these changes. And principle nine, it says that the principles of family support are modeled in all program activity, including planning, governance, and administration. So this is kind of the catch-all principle because it says that all of the above principles should be applied in everything we do. So planning, governance, and administration. And these principles, they have implications for how we develop programs, how they're led, and how we support our staff. All right, so that is the first framework that the standards are based upon. And the next is the Strengthening Families Protective Factor Framework. And we are curious how many of you have heard of this framework before today. We'll give you a moment to respond in the poll that we'll launch here in just a moment. All right, let's see those results. All right, slightly more of you have heard of the protective factors. So that is great. 
And for those of you that haven't, let's fill you in and catch you up. So here on this next slide, you will see the protective factors. So these are the five protective factors. So parental resilience, social connections, concrete support in times of need, knowledge of parenting and child development, and the social and emotional competence of children. And we are going a little lighter touch on this one and um, definitely encourage you to visit um, the Center for the Study of Social Policies website and um, check it out. There is so much information on their website. Encourage you to dive right into the protective factors. So now that we have talked about both frameworks that the standards are based upon, we are going to talk about the standards themselves. So the standards have five sections that each represent a key element of quality practice. So you can see here on the slide, um, the five areas. And so they are family centeredness, family strengthening, diversity, equity, and inclusion, community strengthening, and evaluation. And within these standards, there are actually 15 standards themselves. And each standard has one to two sets of indicators um, of both uh, foundational and high quality. And then we'll um, the foundational quality indicators, they demonstrate the basic application of the standard. And then programs after that, they build upon the foundational quality indicators to achieve high quality indicators, which represent deeper integration of the standard. And so each indicator is followed by two to four examples from the field that illustrate its application. So these examples are provided as illustrators and are not meant to be uh, a checklist or limited to the ones that you'll see cited in the standards workbook. Um, in the certification training on the standards that's offered, a significant focus is on the participants thinking of their own examples in, that uh, demonstrate indicators in ways that are relevant to their own programs. And as programs are applying the standards, they are encouraged to identify their own examples that demonstrate the indicators in ways that are relevant to their own communities. So let's talk about the difference between foundational and high quality here, just for another minute. Um, so the foundational quality indicators, they create a solid foundation for the family strengthening and support programs, such as the ones represented here today. And foundational quality indicators are designed to be met within the basic resources of a typical family support and strengthening program. And then high quality indicators, they are built upon the foundational quality being in place first. So we aren't just jumping to high quality, we have to have that solid foundation underneath us. And programs are encouraged to strive to meet high quality indicators in order to serve families most effectively. And some high quality indicators, they may require additional capacity building or additional resources to meet. Let's look at this continuum along the bottom here. So we start on the left with um, foundational quality not yet addressed. And then we're approaching foundational quality and then we're meeting foundational quality in the middle. So that is where foundational quality begins. That's where quality begins, right? Um, and then we continue along the continuum to approach high quality and then meet the foundational and high quality. One thing that you'll see here on the bottom right is that that arrow keeps going after we've met both foundational and high quality. So this is because quality improvement is very much an ongoing continuous process. And that is why high quality is not considered maximum quality. And also important to mention that implementing the standards, it's very much a developmental process. And it's common that programs may see aspects of their work at different points along the quality continuum. So as we go through the standards, you may determine that you're already doing quality work in various areas 
And then hopefully you also can identify areas to work on further. So for the first four sections of the standards, this is the arrow that we use to describe the movement from foundational to high quality. So on the left, we see foundational quality. And then on the right, we see high quality, which represents deeper integration of the standard into the program. So what moves foundational to high quality are the elements in the arrow. And um, so let's look at these together. So looking in this arrow, the first thing we'll talk about is formal structure. So this is design, policies, procedures, and intentional strategies with committed resources that ensure consistency of practice. And then we have staff training. So staff training to support the implementation of the standard. And then we have family partnership. So partnering with families in the implementation of the standard. So each of these elements helps ensure that the standards are more deeply integrated into the program practice. So for example, at foundational quality, we may do something that's good practice, but how are we actually ensuring that it wasn't just a one-time occurrence? And then at high quality, we've actually set up systems, training, and or we have partnered with families to ensure that it continues to happen. So the particular elements and the number of elements needed for high quality differ for various indicator pairs. So sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two, and sometimes it's all three of these, but it's never anything other than these three things that move us to high quality. All right, let's look at this. So this is a snippet right out of the standards of quality. And if you've downloaded them, this will look familiar to you. So the standard here is that the program engages families to participate in program development and implementation. And um, we see on the left, the foundational quality indicator is that the program solicits input from families to shape and plan the program and services. And then on the right, we see the high quality. So the program's design supports partnering with families to have an active role in the development and implementation of the program. So as you can see here, we have put um, in that high quality indicator, we put um, the, the elements that move us to high quality in bold and in italics. And um, you'll see the arrow that formal structure and family partnership are actually what are moving us to high quality. So this, um, just like the arrow that we just looked at um, for the first four sections, similar to that, um, this is one that is for the fifth section of the standard. So evaluation is so incredible that it gets its very own arrow. So as with the arrow that we just looked at for the first four sections of the standards, uh, we see foundational quality on the left, high quality on the right, uh, which represents deeper integration, but the elements in the arrow are different. So the elements that we have here are data analysis. So collecting data is foundational quality, but then if we analyze that data, that's what moves us to high quality. And then sharing evaluation results. So we're sharing these results with various stakeholders, such as the families that we're working with. And then we have program modification. So this means changing the program as a result of what we learned from evaluation. So we aren't just doing it for evaluation's sake. We are actually doing something with it. All right, let's talk about those implementation tools that I had mentioned earlier. So the first that we'll talk about is the program self-assessment tool. So this was designed for program teams of managers, direct service staff, and parent leaders to reflect on standards implementation and quality improvements. So this is a critical thinking exercise for program teams. So managers, direct service, um, parent leaders, everyone coming together. And it's recommended that all team members involved in using this tool have been trained on the standards first. 
And the staff uh, self-reflection checklist, it consists of 18 questions um, for staff members to use as an ongoing reminder of how to implement the standards. So staff are encouraged to put this tool in a place that they can see it regularly, such as above their desk. And the standards participant survey, um, possibly the most important uh, tool that we'll talk about, is um, measures how well the program is meeting the standards from a typical, um, from the participant's point of view. So it's not a typical satisfaction survey. And the questions actually mirror those that are on the staff, um, that staff self-reflection self tool. So if staff members are mindful of these questions, then the program participants are likely to give them high scores. So again, all of these tools are on the NFSN website and are included in the standards training to go over an in-depth version. And the participant tool is actually available in uh, English, Spanish, and Chinese. So training is a fundamental strategy uh, for implementing the standards effectively. So the certification training that is offered, um, this is um, in-person or a virtual training that is designed for all management, direct service staff, as well as for funders. And participants receive a certificate that is valid two years from the date they're trained. And this certification training they are offered by, um, conducted by pairs of trained trainers uh, from member networks of the National Family Support Network. So um, networks, funders, and other stakeholders can also contract with the national network to host this standard certification training for programs in their area if they are not standards trainers in their state already. And programs are highly encouraged to come as teams because, um, so both management and direct service, uh, because successful application of the standards does require the commitment and the support of all levels of program responsibility. And with this training, individuals are certified. So not organizations, which integrates the standards into everyone's daily work and provides a professional credential for staff. And all of these trainings are live because the group work and the peer sharing are so valuable for the process of outlearning the standards. And the Training of Trainer Institute is a four day in person or five day virtual training for uh, representatives of NFSN member networks to be able to conduct the certification training in their area. And only network representatives are trained to be trained, which supports the capacity building and establishes a unique, essential, and ongoing role for them within their system of support for families in their area. And um, currently, oh, sorry, currently um, these trainings are all taking place virtually um, via Zoom, but um, the, our committees are looking at um, and figuring out the next steps for moving back to in-person. So stay tuned with that, but currently um, they are all virtual. And despite being all virtual, we are making incredible traction across the country. You can see that we have officially hit 13,000 people certified across um, the country. So really incredible here. Um, you can see the, um, the blue states are where the standards have been to. And you can see that the number of trainings and the number of certified and then the number of trainers that are conducting these across the country. So this is um, a decade's worth of work all on one slide just to see the incredible work that's happening in our field across the country to spread these standards. So um, looking at the training impact, the, um, the survey that's completed after the standard certification training, um, participants report out that they are, um, that their work is enhanced um, 
by the standards, enhancing their work with families. And most of them are also using one or more of those implementation tools that we talked about a few moments ago. So participants are finding the standards helpful and using those tools. And I'm gonna give you just a moment to read these couple quotes that also comes to us from participants across the country. So as you can see here, the standards very much help validate existing work by benchmarking it to national best practice. So also important to talk about, I know we have a uh, network folks represented here today. And so networks have actually formed and expanded through the standard certification training. So for example, one example of that is in Arizona. So the standards uh, provided a common language for diverse providers across the state and um, established a key role for the Maricopa Family Support Alliance in promoting quality practice within their system of care. And as a result, this alliance grew from 21 to 72 state agencies in just a few short years. So networks also strengthen their capacity and sustainability through developing trained trainers. And all funds that are generated through the standard certification trainings are invested back into supporting families. So in order to ensure the accessibility and the affordability of the standard certification training, networks um, with certified trainers may only charge participants within the range of zero up to $150 um, in order to be certified. So intentionally keeping that very affordable and accessible for everyone. All right, so now we wanna talk a bit about implementation. So we're gonna look at the program level implementation and the network level implementation. So first let's talk about program implementation. Um, so you'll see, um, first wanna mention that this font may be a little difficult to read, um, a little small on this slide. So we definitely encourage you to download the, um, from the handouts section, um, the handouts uh, that were linked in the, um, that Dropbox link that was in there, you'll find the program implementation continuum in there. It's also on the website as well. So this um, il illustrates the continuum of standards implementation at the program level. And you'll see the sample steps across the top and then the sample activities and the resources that are available to, to um, advance those steps and the potential costs associated with them. So for example, just by participating in today's webinar, you are already at that prepare phase. So already well on your way. Um, and then that certification training is here in the third column. Um, so definitely encourage you to check this out. But this is how a um, someone at the program level, a roadmap and a guide to help you use the standards. And so I wanna share briefly, prior to my joining the national network um, team four years ago, I managed a family resource center here in Corning, New York, um, which is the Nani Hood Parent and Family Resource Center. And when I began at the family resource center, we were implementing the Strengthening Families Protective Factors and um, other FRCs across the state were as well. So we were doing a lot of great things. We um, were offering, we were doing the, uh, facilitating the protective factor survey. We were having drop-in play. We were having parent-child groups. We offered parent education opportunities. We offered parent groups. We did the ages and stages questionnaire screening. We um, provided information and referral. Uh, and we had a supervised visitation program. And we also held a lot of community events. So we were doing um, a lot of great work in the center, serving families as best we knew how. 
And then um, a little bit later, the um, New York State Family Resource Center Network contracted with the NFSN to bring the standards of quality to family resource centers in New York State. And um, so we became certified in the standards. And then 12 of us from the state went on to become trainers on the standards to create more capacity in New York State as we began implementing the standards. So through implementing the standards, our family resource center saw that the standards very much enhanced our, um, our work that we were already doing. So we were able to increase childcare offerings uh, for parent education classes to better meet parents' needs and ensure that we were reducing as many barriers as possible. We also intentionally uh, improved partnerships with parents. And the staff, uh, we, the staff began to work with families more to complete parent identifying needs and goals and um, recognizing that parents are the experts on their families. The standards also gave us um, the structure to increase the formal structure around our outreach strategies. So not creating extra work, um, but helping us work smarter, not harder with our efforts. The standards also helped us to improve our database system. So including the analysis of that data, making sure that our programming was doing what we wanted it to do. And the standards helped us to create new opportunities to educate parents on advocacy and on leadership. And also through adopting the standards, we realized how crucial it was to have parents formally at the table um, to help develop and plan programming. So just two short months after I um, participated in the certification training, I had an opportunity to participate in the inaugural uh, Developing and Sustaining Effective Parent Advisory Committee training uh, as a way to gather concrete tools to start a parent advisory committee. And then once we started that parent advisory committee, it was so exciting uh, to and see the enhanced ownership that families now had. So looking one level up at the network level, which I know is also represented here today, um, similar to this, you can also find this continuum in the handouts. Um, and Cheryl, would you mind chatting out the link to the um, handouts once more? And um, that was that will be right in the chat. Thank you so much. So that way you can find that right there. Encourage you to download this. So this is for networks that are using the standards at the network level. So again, sample activities across the top, the steps there, the resources that are available to you through the NFSN, and then the potential cost associated with each of these steps. So you'll see some overlapping, overlapping items such as that standards overview webinar, but you'll see some different ones too, because this is looking at the system level. So let's see here. So let's talk a little bit more about the network level. So um, I talked a bit about my experience in New York State. Um, so just want to share a little bit more briefly about that. So we became members of the national network, which of course is not a requirement to use the standards and be trained on the standards, but we did. And um, we then immediately began training on the standards across the state. And the New York State Network also was the funder of the Family Resource Centers in the state. So they very intentionally um, wrote the standards in as one of their grantee requirements to ensure quality and consistent program programming. So all programs across the state began using the standards implementation tools to um, complete the uh, program annual or the program self-assessment tool annually. So that's one that we were doing and submitting to our funder um, just so they could see it wasn't meant to be punitive, but just to keep them in the loop as to where we are and what we're working on. And the network continues today to use this tool um, and the standards as a catalyst for enhancing work with families across the state. 
All right. And then we want to share a couple other implementation tools. Um, we uh, encourage each network that's using the standards to diagram out their own uh, network level implementation plan, but want to show you a couple. So you saw the um, New York one, which looks a little different. This is a San Francisco one. So this is, um, you can see that they have a three pronged strategy that integrates um, them into training, evaluation, and membership. And um, after today's webinar, the, the PowerPoint slides will also be in the handouts, that same folder. So if you want to save that link, it will also be on the website too, but you'll be able to download these to look at them in more detail. Um, and this diagram illustrates how the Colorado network has tiered their trainings for Family Resource Center staff. So all staff at the centers, regardless of roles, complete the uh, standard certification training. So that's something everyone's doing intentionally. And then staff that are working with families and their supervisors complete a um, free 14-hour online strengthening families training that is offered by the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And then staff working directly with families in case management roles complete the 60-hour family development credential. And so as you're reflecting on all that was shared today, um, as we're approaching the end here shortly, want to um, encourage you to just be processing all of the information and um, want to share some considerations with you on why you, why you may want to download the standards. So um, the first is deepening practice. And uh, the second is establishing a common language. I mean, other, you know, healthcare, education, all of these other fields have um, standards. They have a language to be able to talk to each other about across the field, but now ours does too, which is so exciting. And it's also um, wonderful to develop partnership opportunities as well. Another consideration is to utilize shared measurement, measurement systems. It's great for that as well. Uh, to do something concrete to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to be part of a national movement. And we also, another um, thing wanna cover here is just after this webinar, folks would reach out and say, ah, these sound so great. Um, you know, we're interested in learning more. What's our next step? What would be, what would be good to do? So we wanted to outline some sample next steps depending on what you may have already done. So we encourage you to download the standards and review them. So maybe you've done that already, but if not, just go to um, nationalfamilysupportnetwork.org and click on standards and drop down to overview. And then you'll be able to download them. They're right at the top. Um, and then we encourage you to review possible next steps along the program or network implementation continua. So again, in that handouts folder, you can access those. And we encourage you to participate in a standard certification training that's offered by your state network or the national network. And then for funders that are in states without networks that are currently offering the standard certification training, um, take a moment to review that training page to learn about how to contract with the national network to bring the training to your state. And want to put a reminder here for you to put any questions into that Q&A section of the uh, Zoom webinar panel. So please enter those questions. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and share some resources and events with you that are available to you through the NFSN while you're entering any questions that you may have. So coming up um, this month, can't believe it's August already, <laughs> we have a couple of webinars for you to keep on your radar. Um, the next one is on the 17th and is Uncovering America's Best Kept Secrets. So all about Family Resource Centers and Family Resource Center Networks. And then the end of August, we will be spotlighting the California Family Resource Association. So encourage you to check that out as well. Um, they, I know, 
will be sharing tons of information about their network. They've done incredible work with the standards. So definitely encourage you to check that out. We also have a wonderful library um, where you can see about, um, see all the recorded webinars that have been um, archived on the website. So um, the standard certification training. So these ones are open to anyone. So we uh, cordially invite you all, um, uh, you've completed this webinar um, and taken this important step. A next great, uh, great step would be to become certified in the standards and um, check it out. So uh, these are the ones coming up this month and next month. and. Um, so also just a reminder, if you're in a state that already offers these standards, um, you can take a uh, training within your state. And these ones are conducted virtually, so anyone can participate in them regardless of location. They're conducted here on Zoom. All right, so registration information for those is on the NFSN website. And also we talk about in the standards, we talk about the importance of elevating parent voice and how we can do that. And so one um, concrete way is through um, developing a parent advisory committee. So this training is for staff and it is designed um, for um, learning how to develop a new parent advisory committee. It's also wonderful if you already have one and want to strengthen it. So it gives you lots of concrete tools. Um, it's co-trained by a national parent leader as well as one of our staff. So um, make sure you check this out. This is also offered um, each month as well. And this is offered um, also in that fourth week of each month, just like the standard. So this is connected virtually too. So be sure to check this out. And we also want to highlight the Together for Families conference um, is coming up in just a couple of short months. And um, we encourage you to check this out. Um, this is our big tent uh, conference. It's for everyone. So regardless of whether you're working at the program, network, government, you know, any, any level, um, there'll be content for you. If you go to Together for families.org. The address is here on the slide. Um, you can check out and see, you know, what the sessions are, what the plenaries are, who the speakers are, see the more detailed schedule. Um, registration is open, so you can still get into this conference. If you want to um, send a group from your team, just let us know and we can help you with that but we would love to see you at the conference. So be sure to join us. And that is co-hosted by uh, the National Network as well as Families Canada and the Center for the Study of Social Policy. And I'm gonna put my contact information here on the slide. If you um, would like to reach out, we invite you to. And again, if you are from a state that is not yet green on a member map, we would love to connect with you and um, just learn more about your state and how we can support you. All right, let's take those questions. All right. And if you're having any difficulty um, accessing any of the uh, handouts, we those will be posted on the website. Um, those will be there by tomorrow, this time of day. So um, you can access those there. If you, um, and there was a question too about the uh, PowerPoint. So that also will be located on the website um, by tomorrow this time, as well as the recording. So you'll be able to, um, if you wanted to share the recording with a colleague or anything like that, definitely encourage you to do that. Um, and there's also a question about the conference. Is it virtual or in person? Good question. Thank you so much. Um, it's virtual. It's virtual. So we, um, intentionally offering that virtual again this year um, to make it accessible to everyone. We know um, some folks have challenges with um, having some barriers with travel and definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, it'll be a wonderful 
wonderful opportunity to connect and get some great new content. And if there's any other questions, just let us know. Looks like we've answered the question so far. So if you um, think of any questions after we get off of the webinar today, we are um, definitely available via uh, phone and email. Just reach out anytime and we would love to connect with you. So um, Jennifer, so you'd reach out to my colleague about anything related to membership um, or Together for Families. And if you have any questions about the standards and how you might want to consider moving forward, definitely reach out to me anytime. So thank you again for participating in today's webinar. We um, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And um, just as a reminder, when you exit out of the webinar, that evaluation will pop up. So we really appreciate you taking the time to complete the evaluation, um, which helps um, identify your next steps. And so we can support you in any way and to help inform future webinars. So thank you again for your time and spending this, your valuable time with us today. And we hope you have a fabulous rest of your Wednesday. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.